Hey, my YouTube viewing friends, today is the first episode of a new show that I've started with my friend Todd Renenbaum, host of the Bunny Hugs and Mental Health podcast. And we are launching this new show that's going to be a weekly Thursday show, and it's called Mental Health Headline Hot Takes with Nick and Todd. And the purpose of this show is that each and every week we will bring a article with a headline from the mental health news world. And we will debate, discuss, and hopefully come to agreement so that we can continue the discussion and remove the stigma around mental health and what's going on in the news. So hope you enjoy this special first premiere episode. And again, we will be here every Thursday with a new episode. We're coming in hot to give you our hot takes on all the latest mental health news. From headlines and memes to developments and breakthroughs. We go into this show blind with the hopes of learning something new. Before sharing some bunny hugs. And leaving with our eyes wide open. I'm Nick. And I'm Todd. And this is Mental Health Headline Hot Takes. We're glad you're here. Yes, uh, this one is called Philadelphia Lawmakers Vote to Prohibit Supervised Injection Sites in Most of the City. The source is Anna Orso. And she is from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I was thinking I'd just read some chunks here that I uh, of the article that I thought was good. Yeah, um, that I thought were relevant, and then yeah, well, I'll, I'll get your take on it, and then I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we'll do this. I think it actually. So this is fun. Like we should we should document you know verbally here if our minds change on anything that maybe we we did through discussion. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll give you, so quickly I'll give you the full, what the article's about. So there was, I think a, a vote to uh, get rid of safe injection sites in Philadelphia. I think it was 10 of the 11 city councils, councilors voted on it. Uh, so there's a new bill. Not to create. So did they did they have safe injection sites and they're voting to close them? Uh, they have some. I didn't. I it may have said in the article exactly how many there were, but there's definitely some. Uh, and they are. Uh, they don't. Really, so the thing is, the bill is not just to get rid of them, but to make it harder to have them. So you have to go through some hoops and stuff, including like um, mm -hmm. having the neighborhood vote on it and stuff like this. So. They're not saying we don't want it. We're, they're just saying let's shut them down for now and do make it harder. Basically, um, that's my bias thing. Is that they're basically okay. making it harder. But uh, but those in favor of the facility say they prevent drug related deaths, which reached a high point in 2021 when nearly 1,300 people in the city fatally overdosed. 1,300. Wow. In what time frame? That was in 2021. It's that just made my eye twitch. In one year, 1,300 people that they know of have uh, fatally died in, in Philadelphia. Uh, council member, okay, I'm going to screw this name up, Quitsi Lozada. Uh, she's a Kensington-based district, uh, uh, and it's the epicenter of the city's opioid epidemic and home to one of the nation's largest open-air drug markets, drafted the bill, the bill to change the it. Uh, and said the majority of the people who argued against it do not live in the communities most affected, which is true, which is, okay, maybe I'll make my, I'm, I'll give a little opinion hey. before I go on. Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> if, you, if your area that you're representing is the most affected, you'd think you'd want some service like this in there. Right. Uh, anyway. Uh, Lozada's like, but that, can I, can I, can I mm -hmm. play devil's advocate there? Yes. So I can see a scenario where you're in a neighborhood or whatever, where you do have this like epidemic of a problem, mm -hmm. but you don't personally, or someone you love doesn't personally have that problem. Where that right. problem is impacting them is that they don't want the injection sites and that problem in their neighborhood. I'm not saying I agree. Right, and right, I can right. I can even relate that to some 
shit going on in Chicago here. But as someone who, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to villainize the people that don't want it, I want to understand what they say and what their thought process is. I just wonder if maybe that's part of it. It's like, if you're not homeless, you don't know anyone homeless, you don't want homeless people outside your house. Right. And, and I too, I get it. And I'm not um, saying I agree with that. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I understand the thinking. It's just that that's, that's kind of old school thinking. Uh, in fact, I'll jump to a fact that I have here. Um, so I, for those of you that don't know me, I'm in recovery of addictions and I've worked in addictions. And so I'm, I'm kind of biased and kind of passionate and, and I get grumpy when people don't <laughs> don't agree with me <laughs> uh but anyway there was a uh, there's all types of studies like i haven't found a study yet that that says safe injection sites don't save lives and don't help so that alone but this one says overall findings indicate there are no appreciable increases in crime and disorder following the implementation of a safe mm. injection site nor are there increased risks to the health of the local community in the form of increased unsafety disposed needles and syringes and that's because they're going to do it there anyway. You're in the epicenter. Why not just have them say, okay, you're in the epicenter. You're going to be doing it anyway. Just do it over there, and it'll be all safe. All the syringes are put away nicely. Yeah. There's not going to be people on the street ODing. Uh, there'll be, if you do OD, there's people there to save your life. And there's pamphlets and counselors and all types of things to take care of you and promote you to try to go to treatment as opposed to now, just doing it on the street anyway. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. Now is with this scenario, is there like a path to treatment and recovery? Cause I, what yes. I, and I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little ignorant to this topic, which is good, right? Cause I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to learn from this article. But my thought is, and this is where, so I go back and forth in my own head on the, should all drugs be legal and, you know, taxed and regulated and all of that stuff. And then we have these safe injections. But what bothers me is when there isn't a legitimate, realistic path to recovery. Because what I don't want is a bunch of people in an epicenter that just live there and get high all day because that doesn't help them. That helps them with the immediate need, but that doesn't put them on a road to recovery. And in our stupid country, I'm very angry with America right now as a country, so I'm going to call them stupid. My stupid country. We just would rather throw people in prison than rehabilitate them into society. And I think that is absolutely deplorable. So I want to say that clear. But I know for sure that at in my core, I want to be people first. So I think that making sure there's a legitimate path to recovery and there's a, a process, like you said, with counselors, getting into treatment plans. But a lot of these folks don't have the resources for a counselor or treatment plan. So if that's part of this, then I think that this is a, um, you know, a, a piece of that puzzle of recovery. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I can't say for every site, but I'm assuming so because no one just no one that works in addictions wants to work at a safe injection site where they just hang out and watch people get high. Like they're right. there because they want to help. So um, in my in my province of Saskatchewan here in Canada, it's kind of a hot debate right now too. safe injection sites because there's the city of Saskatoon um, mm. have a, has an amazing one. And um, so when people go in there, it's not just using they, they have access to to try to get housing to to get uh you know social services food, um uh, even food banks and stuff and treatment and counseling so because we, if anyone that knows anything addiction is it's not just you choose to use and that's addiction i mean it's no. it's a much more complex thing like housing mm -hmm. like education like finances like all this stuff so um i'm assuming the ones in philadelphia run similar maybe not all the same maybe services I'm just, maybe i'm just one of two things i don't trust that we do that as as a country or philadelphia as a state or philadelphia pennsylvania as a state <laughs> philadelphia as a city um so that's probably a little pessimist there but the way that sounds up in in your town makes perfect sense right yeah um and yeah and again like i don't know the situation of the specific 
uh, sites that they're doing in Philadelphia. But yeah. generally speaking, it, it's almost like uh, you're invited into the door to use your drugs, and then here's all these services. So, I mean, the safe injection site part of it is really just a small part of it, generally. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's the same thing because – uh, the people that are running these sites are actual like advocates and stuff. So it's not just like a bunch of druggies going, hey, man, let us just do some drugs. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're educated people that are trying to help. Um, yeah. I just don't trust our country. I mean, this is not, <laughs> this is not for now, but what we're doing here with the immigrants in Chicago is insane to me. And everyone's just like oh, looking at this. I'm not sure what's going on. About... <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll have to that's find an article episode. for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anywho, I've hardly scratched the surface here. So, <laughs> uh, Lozada's lo uh, legislation would update the zoning code to designate, uh, supervised drug consumption sites as a prohibited use in nine of the city's 10 council districts, West Philadelphia's third district represented by Democrat. They throw Democrat and Republican in here a few times because generally speaking, the Democrats are for Republicans are against. Hey, got to keep not, us divided. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Gothier was the only district not included. Um, applicants who go before the board and are facing opposition can see their cases drag on for years. So it's either either they think they're doing their district a favor by doing this so that, you know, everyone gets all the information slash if we have too many hoops to jump through, then it'll never yeah. happen. Or uh, the Republican controlled design. state Senate has also advanced a bill to ban supervised drug consumption sites statewide. So even if Philadelphia said, yes, we all the councils are like, yes, let's have uh, safe injection sites. It doesn't matter because the Republican controlled <laughs> Senate is like, no, uh, Nikhil Savile, American politics, <laughs> yeah, Canadian dude. Uh, <laughs> Nikki Savile, who represents part of or parts of Center City in South Philadelphia, Philadelphia voted against the, that legislation and testified against the council bill Thursday. <sighs> so that's kind of the gist of what's happening there. Um, but uh, so when I read this, I always wonder why is this a political issue? Even why is something that's like proven? Like I, 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 I can't find anywhere online unless it's like a right wing newspaper or something. And I don't want to politicize it, but for some reason it's always politicized this issue. Like, yeah. Why is saving people's lives politicized or how to save people's lives? I or, mean, I ask myself that question a hundred times a day about a hundred different things. <laughs> and I think this is, you know, the 101 today. <laughs> um, we are polarized against each other in our country and really across the world on every single matter because we are positioned to do that through our politics our political leaders and the way that the media represents it and you just said it straight and clear unless i read a conservative newspaper i'm not hearing this and then if i read this i'm hearing this well that is on purpose because what do you do and what do the social media algorithms give you and what does your Google alerts give you? They give you stuff based on what you've already consumed, which only reinforces your belief system instead of challenging you with an outside thought. And so right. that's what I think you're having here. And instead of having a real conversation about addiction and saying, how do we as a society want to treat people who are sick with addiction and what are our beliefs of who they as human beings should be treated then it's just going to continue to be a divide it's going to flip-flop depending on who's who's running the government at the moment and we've seen that I, and i don't follow canadian politics very much but i know you don't <laughs> listen we got enough we got enough problems in our own country here and and uh, i think they duplicate up there in a lot of ways but you know it's just it's very sad because i see all of these things going on and we're just fighting with each other about them instead of going at the root cause and we're attacking people based on their opinions and calling them names instead of saying hey we have an issue here yeah yeah well even during the council debate they had people from on both sides of the of the 
uh, issue, stand up and talk. And I get, and it got really heated. There was people that were right. advocating for it and people that were really against it. And uh, yeah, there was times where it was like, got super heated and it was like, but the, the, well, this is another thing that drives me nuts. It's like, okay, we're going to poll the, we're going to confer with people if they, if they want it in their neighborhood or not and all this stuff. Well, it's happening in your fucking neighborhood anyway. Right. One. And, well, two, why, and why, why are we addressing are asking, that? Yeah. Yeah. And two, why are you talking to people that don't know that aren't professionals that aren't experts <laughs> you're just asking people for opinions well i mean everybody has an opinion doesn't mean that it's a fact yeah. so why do you talk to people that actually or backed have... by research or anything yeah yeah uh so that that always drives me nuts it's like uh me well too. we've we've had some people call in here recently and it's like i'm, I'm getting a little heated because uh, my provincial government there's some stuff happening right now too that mm. is very similar and, and it's like Okay, you have everyone that work that's working on the ground in addictions telling you one thing. Uh, you have professionals telling you one thing, but then you have one grumpy person saying, "Ah, oh, you're just you know um, get enabling off my them. lawn." They're yeah. enabling them, and that's enough for them to say, "No, nope, we're not." So then, them. what what I would like to ask that person is, "What's your solution?" Well, treatment. Okay, so, so we can we can use government funds to build treatment programs for these people, right? Well, no, I ain't paying for their treatment. Some say that so, somewhere. Okay, so then how do we pay for it? If that's your solution and you don't want to pay for it, how do we pay for it? And you, I, I mean, I will just take them down every stupid answer that someone gives. Well, the most frustrating thing is, and this is this point was made in the article too. They talked to a, a parent that lost a, a kid to overdose. Mm. Okay. My child wasn't ready for treatment, so they were still using, so they died. It's like, how, what, I can't put my kid to treatment. They're fucking dead. Like, so if they were at using, but at a safe injection site, where if they were overdosing, there was people there to help them and to also yeah. encourage them to go to treatment, maybe they would have been ready to, to go there. Maybe they wouldn't, but at least they're alive and able to go when they are ready. Yeah. Sorry. I think that's a great Sorry. point. I can't, I can't, no, it's all right. So what what would you, like in a nutshell, what would you say would be a solution to this debate? Okay. So I'm, I say extreme, but it's not really. Whatever's been happening for the last 50 years clearly is not working. Clearly. <laughs> okay. So maybe it's time to like flip the script a bit uh portugal ha they um legalized all drugs this is about yep. 10 15 years ago it's a while ago now yeah and it is proven that all that money that they put into policing and 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 courts and all this stuff that they to try to fight the war on drugs they put into health care and <laughs> now um, That'll never happen in my country. It's like the drug, um, like the addiction rates dropped something like 70% in like mm -hmm. five years. Like it was, astro I, I don't quote me on that, but it was some astronomical number like that. And uh, yeah, like it's not like Amsterdam where they have like heroin cafes. It's just you don't go to jail for having heroin. Uh, this is another point I wanted to make. So by... It's been 23 years. Sorry, I wanted to look up that exact number because I think it's important. Okay. It's been 23 years. They did that in 2000. Damn, that is. They early. had a drug. Yeah, they had a drug addiction problem, a big one. To address it, they did systemic change in 2001. I'm sorry, it was 2001, and mm, they decriminalized it. Right. So it's not. It'll, yeah, it's not legal. It's just decriminalized. So. Decriminalized, right? Drug <laughs> users in treatment declined from one thousand one hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty-two from twenty fifteen to twenty one, as, and that was a cost of eight a cost savings, I should say, of eighty two point seven million down to seventeen point four million on addiction. <laughs> That's a pretty significant decrease in spend let's let's make sure yeah. we throw this article i'm going to throw this article in the, the show notes too okay um well that's another yeah that's another thing that drives me batty so so it's generally right right side of center politics that 
that are against this, but yet those that's also the same kind of group of people that are very, you know, save money and it's it's always about budgets and finances and but it's proven hardcore that this is gonna save you money, but they still go out of their way not to do it. So it's like, well, okay. I don't get that. It's no, it's super defeating when you hear stuff like that. And the other point I wanted to make was um uh I, I, I talked to someone on the podcast actually, Bunny Hugs Mental Health, <laughs> about uh about the language that you, you we use around addictions and stuff. And mm. when people are considered criminals and demonized, do you think like that does not boost their morale? So if they, <laughs> re, if they relapse and use, they feel like a junkie, they feel like a criminal. So if you treat someone like a criminal, they're going to, they're going to act. Criminally. Oh yeah. That's if a you, great point. if you treat them with empathy and kindness and, uh, you know, whatever demon is eating them as a health issue instead, then they're more likely to seek help, more likely to feel accepted right. and like they're going to, they're in a safe place. Right. So yeah. there's a lot I mean, of shame with it. They're, oh, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. As someone that's seven years, I'm seven years sober Monday. Uh, so nice. Two, Congratulations. Two days, two days. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and who worked in the place that I went to as a client, I can tell you there's a lot of shame, a lot of shame. And a lot of people don't get help because it's shameful. Yeah. Like, how do you ask mm -hmm. for something? Let's like, if you were doing something that you consider shameful, how do you talk about ask it openly and ask for help? Yeah. And that's, so, anyway. uh, that's the story of my mental health. I was shamed for it. And then I stopped talking about it. <laughs> the one <laughs> right? time I tried yeah. to when I was a teenager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the, but the, then the sad thing is that sticks with you for a long time. It's not it like does. just that day. <laughs> it's like, it oh, I'll try again tomorrow. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah, um, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about today. Um, do you, do you want to add anything more or should we? transition to oh i gotta i gotta change the subject I'm, I'm... okay all right let's go <laughs> let's go to something that really grinds my gears okay. <laughs> um so today i wanted to cover so it's the start of november right and it's men's health month um so it's weird because i thought june was men's men wait it's men's, men's health? mental health and then men's so it's sorry, it's men's mental health, and then it's men's health month. So we have men's mental health month in June, where it's just oh. about mental health, the rest of your health doesn't matter. And then <laughs> now it's about all of your health, including men's mental health. And gotcha. so what I what I got here is a, uh, this is more of a general topic, but I wanted to highlight this article just because we're talking headlines and we're talking these important issues, right? So November initiates push to better men's mental health is the headline. This is written by Jake Pearson. Jake Pearson writes for CBS 23 WIFR of Gray Media, whatever that is. Gray Media, <laughs> don't know. But um, what really, there's two things I really want to cover here. One is obviously men, mental health, but I know I've told you this before, but I, I get a little perturbed when we have these months of highlighting issues in society or in our culture, when there are issues every day and every other day outside of that day or month that they're being celebrated on. And my, yeah. my frame of mind on this changed several, several years ago when I saw that Morgan Freeman quote. Where he's like, there isn't a black, there shouldn't be a Black History Month. Black is part of our history. It should just be history. And I thought to myself, mm. that is the best way to look at it, right? Men's mm -hmm. health isn't just a November issue. It's a January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December issue. So I get really frustrated by this. And I and listen, I, I use the opportunity to talk about this stuff because it is important. And I feel like you have a more captive or more open audience when there's, you know, one of these these highlights of men's mental health month or men's health month. But you know, we have, and this is from the article, we have six million men in the United States that are affected by depression every 
single year. Okay. 40% of them don't talk about their mental health, according to the vice president of health services at Rose Crane, which is Raymond Garcia. Statistics show that men die four times as often as women via suicide. And everybody, anywhere you look, blames the stigma. So what the heck are we doing? Like, how do we have days and months and these type of statistics after we're doing all of this awareness and we know what the problem is and we still have this ingrained in our culture that men have to be masculine and, and, you know, talking about your feelings or experiencing some sort of mental, you know, health challenges or mental illness is just something a man shouldn't experience. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So do you think by having a special month just for to talk about this stuff is not doing anything? Or do you think it's making the stigma worse? Or do you think it's making so it I, better? I don't, I don't think. Or do you think it's it, just you, no point to it? <laughs> no, I think. So here's the thing. I think it's the best we got right now, right? It's better to have a month or a day or whatever than it is to have nothing at all. So I, I do, yeah. I do want to make that clear. But what bothers me is I don't see the same men's mental health posts or the same people talking about it outside of these designated time periods we're allowed yeah. to be vocal about it. And that's where I see the challenge to like really removing these stigmas around it to really show men that you are allowed to not be okay. You are allowed to be depressed, have anxiety, suffer from addiction. Like there's any of this stuff that happens to people, you're allowed to feel, you're allowed to express and you're allowed to, to heal. Yeah. I just don't, I think it's so hard because it's not a consistent issue. And, and that goes to mental health in general too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, boy. Uh, and I, I, so it was like 10 years ago, I was in the psych ward after an attempt and I thought I was being really brave and stuff by even going to the hospital for mm -hmm. asking for help. I was already seeing a psychologist. I was, I was, I was talking. Um, and, and at the same time, they also shooed me out the ER and was like, we don't have friends. <laughs> sorry. Like, so, so that, that's the part that really frustrates me. It's like, everyone's saying, you know, it's okay to be this and go talk and be open with people. But then it's like platitudes and then, and then not get any validation any fucking way. So it's like, well, why the hell I did talk and now I'm embarrassed and I've upset people that are worried about me, but yet nothing's yeah. being done or, or some, you know, if your spouse is very unvalidating or your boss is like, you know, we care about mental health here at our job and whatever. And then it's Don't, like, you know what, we are going to talk about that <laughs> because I talk about that and write about that on LinkedIn all the time. I, I can't, you know, I, I was laid off from my job. We'll get into this later. When I was laid off from my job, my biggest pet peeve was them saying, my network is open to you, our CEO. My network is open to you. Yeah, I have an idea. Why don't you give me a severance package that's going to keep me on my feet until I find a new job? Do you know what I mean? Like, why don't you, if you really care, why don't you give me some mental health support? Because job loss is one of the worst things you can feel and one of the, the greatest forms of grief right it's so anyway we'll save that one because i'll find yeah, it already, yeah yeah for sure but yeah, yeah i agree yeah. and it's almost like the platitudes of all of it and even the you know people that post sometimes on social media thank you but also like are you doing that because it's the popular thing to do or is this something you're willing to talk about in march or in december mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah i do know I find, so uh, I don't know, these months don't, or these weeks or days or whatever, because they're, they're all the time, which is yeah. good, I guess. I, I like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm on the side of just like, I work, well, work in mental health, uh, but I also don't like, on uh, that, that month or that week on the podcast, I'm not like, hey, it's this week or this month, because it's like, I just kind of ignore them. Because it's like I'm doing this all day, yeah. every day. So it that's a good I, point. It's like I, well, and I think you know. Now you're making me reflect and think internally, which is a good thing. 
<laughs> maybe it is something that's because specifically around mental health that's become frustrating for me because I, I am in it every day. And then I get to see people or I have to see people pop up on the day or the month and start mm. talking about it like they've been there all along. And so maybe right. that's something I need to find peace with. Look at maybe. that. We're growing and learning. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey man you don't actually care have you ever been depressed man mm. this is just a fad for you what one here a screwy thing is so here in canada we have bell let's talk day and it's in january and bell is a company that started it and now it's like almost a national holiday for this freaking company wow. that came up with this day and so now it's like uh, at first it was really cool because there weren't big companies and there weren't weeks and days like this. Uh, but then after a few years, I was like, you know what? This is just a big fucking PR stunt. For this. <laughs> and now it's turned into like, it's borderline a national holiday. Bell wow. last talk days, like McDonald's depression month. You know, it's like, wait, you know, what? this is, we'll have to talk about this another time. That's like when the George Floyd stuff was happening across the world, the protests, mm. and you'd have these giant corporations like Amazon. You turn on your Amazon Prime and it's like, Black Lives Matter. And it's like, yes. I have an idea, Amazon. If Black Lives Matter so much, why don't you pay your black workers a a decent living wage <laughs> instead of instead of paying them $15 or whatever crappy salary they were getting at the time? And they don't have to wear diapers in the warehouse. And, yeah. And like <laughs> give them bathroom breaks. So they don't have to pee in empty water bottles. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. it's just, if it's the way the tide's going, these companies want to hop on and, and, you know, do their, you know, fiscal or social responsibility and just see if it's another new outlet to drive in some extra <laughs> revenue. Yeah, man, it, it is getting bad. I know a lot of yeah. uh, my friends in the LGBTQ too, like in, cause June is also uh pride June month. Team. And it's like, oh. it's like, um, yeah. When McDonald's yeah. has the rainbow M and stuff is like, piss off. Oh, I know. <laughs> what was that I know. Pepsi commercial with w w what's her name? One of the Kardashians is like putting the flower in the gun or something like that. Jeez, I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a, just brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. <laughs> it was bad, brutal. But, so, but yeah, but yeah I, I guess in conclusion from mine, unless you have something else you want to add to, I just, well, I would like everyone to think when you see it's mental health awareness month, you see it's men's health month, you see it's breast cancer awareness month, all that stuff. It's the best we can do right now, so we should take advantage of that. But be conscious of people that struggle with this stuff that you don't struggle with every single day. And the very person that you look at and you think is, is fine might not be fine from physical illness, mental illness, family issues, friends issues, work issues. And let's just be conscious and mindful of people and the struggles that they deal with that you don't see. And I think if we all try and take that approach outside of the days and the months that are dedicated to awareness, we can become a much more compassionate society. Says you. <laughs> right. No, no, I fully agree. But, <laughs> but it's funny that uh, you kind of said that it was like, Oh, you know what? Because this is my passion. Maybe I am being more harsh about it. So then I thought, I used to I used to make this joke. Um, I can't remember what the day of the year it is, but it's Reptile Awareness Day, and I'm like, I'm fully aware of those reptiles. But I wonder if people who are like really into reptiles feel the same way we are right now. They're like, uh, a, reptile every day is Reptile Day. That's, <laughs> that's actually quite quite a good point. That's quite a good point. <laughs> <laughs> At least they're getting sponsors. We're not getting. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, I agree. You don't know what people are going through, and this uh, maybe has nothing to do with the article. But I I'd like to make a quick little little story sure. here. Uh, so, two days ago, I was doing some speaking uh, for in front of nursing students about about my story with struggles with stuff, and uh, the instructor is a friend of mine from like decades ago, and we haven't talked for a long time, uh, and she's never heard my full story. So I t I 
told my full story and then she kind of said in front of her class she's like it's so crazy because when we found out what had happened and that you tried to take your life and then you you ended up being an alcoholic and addiction stuff it was like it blew our minds because mm. you were always the life of the party you're always the joker you always made sure that everyone else was having fun and laughing and joking and it was just like such a shock uh and no one no one's really told me that before so um i've been doing this for quite a while now and so it was just like two days ago it was like <laughs> i too and i think oh, yeah it's interesting because it does people project i've been reading this this book um and uh people project their view of the world onto other people and i don't even think we know we're doing it right mm. like I, I realized, for example, my view of the world is that I don't like to be, I, I'm auto I like autonomy. I don't like to have my space invaded. I don't want the unexpected phone call. <laughs> I don't, do you know, like these are things like I protect my space, I protect my peace. But then I think the same thing when I'm like, oh, I really want to talk to this person or, oh, I really want to <laughs> text it or text this person to hang out or something like that. I and I'm like, their if, space. <laughs> yeah, if someone invade, if someone like inadvertently or, or not inadvertently, if someone calls me and they didn't ask permission or <laughs> ask if I'm available, I kind of get bothered by that because <laughs> I think it's like you need something right now. You have no idea what I'm doing or what's going on. Like, let's plan it. Let's let, let me know, you know, and that's different if it's an emergency, right? If it's a, yeah. if it's a real emergency, but don't, I don't want that unexpected phone call from you to tell me about ABC, whatever that might be. <laughs> tell me ahead of time so that I can like get in the right prepare. headspace. <laughs> yeah. Not, not be disrupt. And I'm introverted. So I have to mentally prepare for all social interactions. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. Man, but gone I is the time of the, like I grew up with a phone that didn't even have color ID, let alone uh, <laughs> texting and stuff. So yeah, it's funny that we've gone from like, it's almost like a fun surprise. Oh, the phone's ringing. Who could it be to who, why would you not text me before you phoned? <laughs> I saw a meme yesterday that was like, some, what did it say? It was something like 20 years ago, we couldn't wait to get that cell phone that we could take with us everywhere and talk to anyone anytime we wanted for 45 cents a minute. And today we don't, we don't talk to anyone. <laughs> it's like, good point. Okay. Mental point. note, I'll, I'll never phone you. Yeah, I'm terrible at it. Like, I'm not good at, I'm not good at my phone. Um, and that's actually, that's really become an output from, from Love is Blind because going on there and having like my phone just constantly going off. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even just like Instagram notifications and stuff like that. I would get like people that I hadn't talked to in forever texting me, calling me, asking to get together. And I'm just like, listen, my, my, life is planned. Like I don't need, you know, no offense. And some people just sent well wishes and that's great. But like, I don't need 50 people contacting me all the time. Like I don't have time for it. I don't have the energy for it. And it's, it's like, you know, that's why like, if I give you my phone number, you know, you're lucky, <laughs> not you specifically, <laughs> but I, I am careful because I've given it to people, um, you know, especially in the last couple of years that I probably shouldn't have that expect too much maybe there's a that's another topic for another day let's do that <laughs> Go ahead. no the injection site i actually like i have um i think maybe i've i've confirmed the way i believe about it as opposed to living in the sandbox that i sort of was living in where i was unsure yeah well when nothing's changed for 50 years and nothing's getting better yeah maybe maybe it's good to have a different opinion yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so. uh yeah the i uh i i've definitely thought more about uh these special weeks and days and months and things and i don't know if i've changed my mind or not but i definitely am more i think about aware of now. the awareness yeah 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 <laughs> yeah exactly hopefully someday it's just this is men's mental health decade <laughs> Century. Let's do century. Let's, <laughs> yeah. get, let's get this. Let's get this. Let's get us all healed. Let's remove the stigma and get us healed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thanks, buddy. That was a good, good. uh, Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Thanks. I'm looking forward to doing this again. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see you next time. Boom. For sure. This has been our mental health headline hot takes. We're so glad you came. Remember, when you heal yourself, you heal the world. Be sure to like this video, leave comments, and suggest articles for future episodes. Hit subscribe to Eyes Wide Open and Bunny Hugs and Mental Health.